A very good afternoon to one and all. Respected Chief Guest, President of Maharashtra State Tribunal, Sri P. S. Taradesa, Judicial and other tribunal members, President, Office Bearers, all past presidents, seniors, and their members and colleagues. With great honor, on behalf of GSTPM, being the law and representative, as the convener of the law and representative committee, I take this opportunity to welcome you all for the inaugural session of the study circle meeting for the year 2024-25. We hope to have a successful year submitting representations regularly and looking forward for your guidance, support, and blessings. At the outset, I would like to invite our chief guest, President uh, P.S. Tararis, sir, and all the office bearers for lighting the lamp. When we light the lamp, yeah, just a second. When we light the lamp, it lights up the world around us. It boosts physical, mental, and spiritual wellness. And we take blessings of goddess to begin a fruitful year ahead. So I request the president, all office bearers, and all the tribunal members, please join us for lighting the lamp. I also request the speaker to join Deepak sir and Rajesh Atal district. We also we also recognize the presence of Kureshi sir, Ramnani sir, Bilolika sir, Nagpada Nagboda sir, Kamtevat sir, Savant madam, Alwari sir and Gurge sir. Welcome to this first study circle meeting. Now I would request our president, Sri Mahesh Markolkarji, to for a welcome speech. Good afternoon, respected president, chief guest Tarari sir, all members of the tribunal, Maharashtra Sales Tax Tribunal, we are welcoming the members. Good day, sir. All past presidents of GST Association of Maharashtra, Rajasthan. 
Yes, sir. All members are requested to. All past presidents of JST Association of Maharashtra present over here. Office bearers of JST PM. Conveners, joint conveners, seniors in the profession, and the friends. At the outset, let me welcome you all in this our inaugural study circle meeting hosted by Law and Representation Committee of GSTPM. This is the first official program of GSTPM after we take the charge. And we welcome you all have come in uh, large numbers. Uh, thanks to all the office bearers and conveners. Sir, almost uh, seven years we have completed as GST. Uh, law has been settled by now. But still, there are certain news which are prop up coming up. Today also, uh, we have seen the newspaper. Our Honorable Nitin Gadkari ji, he has also expressed that there is a 18% tax on life insurance, insurance, which has to be dealt with or come down for this. Then one more litigation is uh, there today, Infosys, around 32,000 crores demand is there their their response is there that also we have seen that and since the all tribunal members and all are there so we feel that uh, seven years is a long time for the uh, government to have this uh, tribunal gst tribunal to set and that is a matter of really concern because the litigation is going to increase high and there will be pressure to Definitely High Court, that matter is there definitely. We will we will request all the past presidents who are present over here and our law and representation committee. We will come join hands together to see that a representation will reach to the concerned authorities. We are fortunate enough, three of our office may, office bearers, myself and uh, Jatin Bhai and Monash, three were witnessed the uh, our uh, amendment and uh, we had been at parliament and we have given our representation to the finance uh, ministry and in state also we'll assure you that whatever queries are there which will be faced by the tax practitioners tax uh, taxpayers as well will represent to the government as well uh, last week we met uh, this week itself we met uh, commissioner of uh, GST at uh, this office of Maharashtra. And he has also, we had also had interaction and we come to know that they are, they still require the law, point of law. So these are the, some of the things which I thought that to share with you. Uh, we will be coming out with various good programs, updations, time and again, time and again. With this, I am uh, welcoming you all. Thank you very much. And I'll yeah. hand over once again to the convener of this. Thank you. Thank you, President, sir, for your warm welcome. Now, before we start this event, I would like to introduce our chief guest for today. Our chief guest for today, many of you all who are, have been regular here must be really aware of it. He is President of Maharashtra State Tax Tribunal, Sri Pramod Shravan Taral. Welcome, sir. To introduce him, uh, first of all, he is a district and sessions court, and he has been there at the Garchiroli and Chandrapur in civil, criminal court, and revenue court. In the year 2008, he was elected as the district and additional sessions judge. From 2005, 2008, District and Additional Sessions Judge at Jalna, Yavatmal, Aurangabad, Vaijapur, and Nagpur. Worked as Additional Principal Judge in Bombay City Civil and Sessions Court and Special Judge in CPI Court, Mumbai. Worked as Principal District and Sessions Judge, Nandurbar, from 2018 to 2021. From 2021-22, worked as Charity Commissioner, Maharashtra State, Mumbai. He retired on... 30th April 22. He joined as the member of the Maharashtra Sales Tax Tribunal on 7th 
November 22, and now he's joined as the president of Maharashtra Sales Tax Tribunal for the year 2023. So we welcome you, sir, and it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. I would request our uh, president to offer him a memento. President, sir. We would also like to felicitate our members from the tribunal. Kureshi, sir. Bilolika, sir. Good day, sir. Honorable member, this is good day, sir. Honorable member. This is Kureshi, Honorable Member, this is Kureshi. Honorable Member, this is uh, Ramnani. Honorable Member, this is Sri Nathgoda, sir. Honorable member, this is Kamte sir. Okay. Honorable member, I got it, sir. Thank you so much. Now we request our chief guest to give us a word of speech. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you, all the dignitaries present on the dais, and my friends. I am truly honored and delighted to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the Goods and Service Tax Practitioner Association for organizing this study circle meeting on the subject in depth analysis of direct tax and GST proposals in the finance bill. 2024 for becoming successful lawyer or practitioner update knowledge of law is the most essential factor i am confident that this endeavor will show the seeds for a brighter more dynamic future in the realm of tax laws i wholeheartedly support your efforts once again i express my deepest gratitude and admiration for your commitment to excellence in the legal field. With these few words, I stop here. Thank you for rem remembering me for this 
ओके जन थैंक यू we also recognize the presence of all our past presidents tb thakkar sir nikita ben deepak thakkar sir rajat talati sir ashwin bhai pradeep bhai kapadia raj pisha alok bhai mehta sunil ji kushlani and pravin shinde ji thank you so much for being here now i would request our honorable secretary uh, mr jatin sheda to give a hearty vote of thanks we also recognize the presence of shri rajkumar adakya central council member thank you very much sir thank you sajal honorable president sir chief guest of the occasion president mahesh pantolkar sir it is my and the members it is my privilege and proud moment to propose a very well deserved vote of thanks and i sincerely express my gratitude to the honorable president sir in spite of uh, your busy schedule honorable sir accepted our invitations uh, to come over here and inaugurate our first hari circle meeting for the year 24 25 as you we all know that our first hari circle meeting has always been inaugurated with the president sir of special thanks so thank you sir for coming over here and uh, i request i also recognize the presence of the, all the past presidents and the honorable tribunal members over here who have come out despite of their busy schedule and come over here and uh, grace the occasion thank you sir for coming over here and ma'am i request everyone to carry out a very well deserved vote of thanks for all the members and thank you now yes uh, so yeah we are starting with the meetings so with the lectures and now let's proceeding with the procedure okay yeah i request everyone be seated for the first technical session now we apologize today only one ac is working we have been instructed that because of some departmental load we just have to keep one ac operating today so kindly bear with us for that so
Yes, your kind attention, please. Now we'll start with the first uh, session. So now today we have two renowned speakers with us. So first we'll have the lecture on GST, in-depth analysis of GST in the Finance Bill 2024. I think we all are eagerly waiting to know and have some clarity on that. So for that, I would like to invite our speaker for today, C.A. Deepak Thakasar. So please welcome. Then our next technical session will be in-depth analysis of direct taxes in the Finance Bill 2024. For that, our speaker is C.A. Rajesh Athavale, sir. So please welcome. I would request my joint convener, Monak Bhatt, to introduce the speakers. Good afternoon, friends. I welcome to the first technical session and uh, our first speaker is uh, Deepak Bhai Thakkar. Uh, Deepak Bhai Thakkar, my apology. <laughs> uh, we all are aware and uh, no introduction is needed, but uh, I need to do the formality. He is the rank holder in BCom from the NM College. He is holding a chartered accountant's degree and practicing since 1984. He is also a past president of GSTPM in the year 2002-2003. He is also he was also editor of Sales Tax Review, which is currently GST Review. He has also co-authored various publications namely Amnesty Scheme in Maharashtra, E-Commerce Transactions under GST, Guide to GST Annual Returns and GST Audit, which is published by WIRC, Guide to MVAT Audit, published by WIRC, Study Material on VAT Laws in Maharashtra for Beginners, Short Publications on Various Subjects of GST, VAT, CST, which has been published by GSTPM. He has presented various papers on the taxation of intangible property, impact of CST, amnesty amendments, and various such presentations he has given. He is also a columnist for the reply and reply to your queries in our current GST review. And he has performed also a mock investigation GST search drama, where he is also one of the uh, performer in that drama, which is a wonderful drama. We have observed that drama in our last session seminar. So with this short introduction, let's welcome today's faculty, Deepak Bhai Thakkar. Now, now I request uh, President. To offer, president to offer a memento to Deepak Bhai Now, I will also introduce the next speaker for the today's session. And uh, Rajesh Athavleji, for the next session, he will be presenting on the budget proposals on the income tax. Rajesh Athavleji is a practicing chartered accountant in the Rajesh Athavle and Associates. He is practicing into corporate taxation, specializing into the international taxation, transfer pricing, litigation, foreign exchange management act. Rajesh ji is also working 
with Deloitte. He has also worked with the Deloitte PwC RSMN company and with ELP as an associate partner. He was tax par partner as BK Khare and company and JMP advisors. Rajesh ji has been advising multinational companies on domestic tax, international tax, and various transfer pricing issues, including economic strategy, business transformation, and transfer pricing documentation. He is also involved in advising clients on family succession, estate planning, merger and acquisition, non-resident taxation, etc. He also advises non-resident clients on Foreign Exchange Management Act, he represents clients in income tax matters, including transfer pricing, and appears in appellate proceedings in the tribunal as well. Rajesh ji has co contributed articles in International Transfer Pricing Journal by IBFD and International Tax Review. He has also contributed in the book published by the Chamber of Tax Consultant on transfer pricing, as well in the publication by the BCAJ on ICDS. With this short introduction, let us welcome Rajesh Athavale ji. Now I request President to offer a memento to the speaker Rajesh ji. Now with this, we can, we are now proceeding with the first technical session, which is on the budget proposals with respect to the indirect taxes. Deepak ji, please. We also have around more than hundred participants. Online, so I would request. Uh, we are starting with the first technical session. Good afternoon, everybody. I thank our association to give me this opportunity to read uh, earlier and uh, present my views. I am uh, also happy that this is an inaugural study circle meeting and uh, all seniors are also present over here. Uh, my co-speaker for direct tax also, I welcome you, sir. And... Uh, <clears throat> 
the ppt what i have prepared is already shared with the association they will be sharing to you all of you so you need not note down anything you can just focus and uh, hear me out i'll be presenting my views there may be some different uh, view or opinion uh, so bear with me another aspect about uh, question answers uh, whatever time i think i have 1 hour and 10 minutes or so so i'll try to finish in my time so we'll be able to hear for direct tax also and any question i think you please park it at the end we will deal with them right so yeah yeah theek so this uh, <clears throat> union finance bill which we are discussing i'll be going as per clauses but i'll be taking subject wise clauses not in the order of the clauses so we have uh, for cgst almost uh, 36 clauses 110 to 146 of the finance bill for igst there are four utgst and gst compensation one so totally 44 clauses are there and uh, i'll be touching upon almost all somewhere i may just skip it it's there in my notes which you can refer later on in my presentation i have mentioned about the clause number as well as the reference of the section which is to be amended or sub sections which i may not speak on but it's there in the notes this particular union budget is already now passed by parliament on 30th july and the budget is for almost 48 lakh crore rupees out of which it is expected the direct tax contribution of income tax and corporate tax to the tune of 22 lakh crore equally by gst 22 lakh crores so direct and indirect tax now is uh, giving a 50 50% share to our gdp and some other uh, uh, collections uh, 4 lakh crores so total budget is for 48 lakh crore the provisions will be effective from as notified by the government in official gazette once the uh, bill is uh, enacted after president's uh, consent assent and it will be from that date or the date mentioned in a respective provision of the finance act the first i'll be touching upon uh, is of the levy and tax collection we all know that uh, certain products are kept out of uh, the gst net say the uh, a liquor for human consumption as well as uh, the petrol diesel and so on so the liquor for the vehicles so both this kept aside and one major raw material for the liquor which is the extra neutral alcohol ena what we call so undenatured extra neutral alcohol or rectified spirit which is used for manufacture of alcoholic liquor for human consumption it is a main raw material so if raw material is taxed under a different law say gst and the finished product not under gst but under the vat law so to remove this anomaly uh, this is uh, taken out of the purview of gst simultaneously the cgst and relevant clauses of igst and utgst is also amended so on this product vat is already levied by the states and our maharashtra state is levying 20% on this ena under schedule entry b4 from august 17 itself so the question here arises is that effective date to this particular amendment should have been given as first of july 2017 the bill is silent about that but i expect that it will be from july 17 going to the next amendment i am touching upon the transactions uh, kept outside the purview of the gst again by schedule 3 right we have schedule 1 a deemed supply between related parties and distinct person there is no no consideration schedule 2 says we define that this particular aspects will be for supply of goods and this will be treated as supply of services so now i am touching upon schedule 3 which is for the transactions or activities which is treated neither as supply of goods nor as supply of services we all are aware of this 
Now, in this particular schedule three, there are eight paras and eight different items are there, which is treated as no supply. In this, para nine is inserted, and this is inserted just for insurance company. Para 10 is also inserted, which is for the insurance company. I just explained. In my notes, I have mentioned about that exact clause, ad verbatim, in italic, so you can also interpret in your way. So para 9 says that share in the co-insurance premium received by co-insurer from the lead insurer is treated as no supply, subject to payment of GST on entire premium by the lead insurer. Say I am a lead insurer, my co-insurer is there and we execute the insurance policy and uh, I pass on some portion of the premium with my co-insurer. So technically what happens, we both are supplying services. Maybe I am supplying to the main insured person, he is supplying to me and ultimately to the insured person. So the government thought it fit that let both be not taxed if the lead insurer is paying the tax on gross amount, then the question of again taxing that portion to which I share with the uh, co-insurance is uh, uh, let us keep it out. Now here, same way, para 10 says, where there is a reinsurance and on gross reinsurance premium, if the tax is paid, then commission or the portion of reinsurance premium also should be kept out of the GST net. That means, say I am giving insurance policy to a particular person and I'm charging say 100 rupees. And again, I'm going to a reinsurer and I'm I'm sharing my certain risk uh, with the another insurance company and say that certain risks I'll be bearing and certain risk they will be bearing. So say I'm also paying some premium to them, say 30, 40 rupees or so. So both are taxed. The government said, okay, let us not tax because 40 rupees, what I pay is part of that 100 which I am to get. So uh, both are kept outside the purview of their uh, GST law. But this is internal, right? Insurance premium will be taxed as a customer or consumer. We have to pay what uh, just said earlier that Nitin Gadkari has uh, requested the FM to remove uh, or lower down the GST rate. Going further, the question here arises, here also the bill is silent about the effective date of this two paragraph, 9 and 10. And if we see para 7, which was inserted for a transaction in a non-taxable territory, and that was effected from February 19, and para 8 also simultaneously incorporated for high seas transactions sale from bond and so on. And they said that this is treated as no supply. Hue and cry was there, double taxation was happening. ITC was then not get uh, received by a recipient. So to remove that, they said, okay, para eight, we will introduce and implement right from July 7th. Though it was uh, made operative in uh, 2019. So here also I am expecting some clarification when the bill will be finally converted into act or when the notification of effective dates will be coming. So maybe from pros prospective uh, effect or retrospective, you have to see this. Here they said for para 8, no refund. So if somebody has already paid the taxes and all that, no refund. Now here there is no problem also because suppose I have charged something to my insured person and again somebody is giving me certain services and he charges me, I'll be obviously taking ITC. So if there is no supply, the question of ITC also will be removed from that. So <clears throat> another aspect that once this treated as a no supply, will it be deemed as exempt supply and proportionate common inputs or services ITC will be reversed? Answer is no. Because for exempt supply, for reversal of ITC on common inputs and so on, uh, uh, there is a separate explanation given under uh, the sections which I have mentioned here, 17.3 and Rule 43 and 45, which one has to refer. So if there is no reference of this parrot there, the question of reversal also will not arise. So as we are thinking about 
something going out of the text net, right? Another power now government is taking, which says not to recover GST when, when there is no GST levied by those suppliers or it is short levied as a result of general trade practice. So here's new section 11A powers are being taken by the government and they will be using this power in which scenario? Let us see. Add verbatim I have given so that you can interpret yourself also. I'll be giving some aspect what I think uh, uh, proper. So this is that if the government is satisfied that a practice was or is generally prevalent regarding levy of the tax or non-levy of the tax on any supply, then in such a scenario, the tax may not have been levied by the trade bodies and the persons concerned and covered in those chain. And accordingly, the government may come out with a notification. Of course, recommendation of GST Council will be there. And they'll say that either whole of tax we will not collect or partial, depending upon the trade practice, what has prevailed. Right. So here, let us see what exactly it is. So something may happen that considering a supply, the lawmakers thought that this is taxable, but the trade practice interpreted it as not taxable. Or say the trade practice thought that it will be taxable at 12% or 5% by this, but the other entries are also there and the government or the lawmaker feels that no, it is 18% or so. So when some such issue arises, then in that case, it is an industry problem, a trade problem of that particular sector. So they thought fit that let us uh, remove this particular analogy and uh, whether it is not levied, so we may also then forgo all the tax or if it is short levied by the industry based on their interpretation or advice given by the experts into the field, then government say even we will accept it. But here, this is a trade practice to be seen. So their associations, representations will have to be going to the government. It's not that one person goes and say, I have been following this, that will not be there. So uh, trade practice, how it will be then uh, considered by the government in implementing this, will, the time will say. As is, where is basis, the circulars are using now nowadays, right? As is, where is basis, that means if the tax is paid by somebody, either wholly or partly, may not get referred. So the more law compliant person may be hit hard or uh, the defaulter may get benefit. Now, as is, where is basis means what, you know, it's a commercial term. But now in the law also, we have been now using this. It means a contract for a thing to be transferred as it is, which is existing as on today. And along with its default or the defects, the transfer happens between these two contracting parties. And something may be apparent, something may not be apparent, the default or fault, which may be later on known. But I have said, I am supplying you as is where is basis. So the government is saying, we are supplying you the law and as is where is basis, we will treat it that. So, uh, well, this is the novel concept now adopted by the government as well as the uh, circular also coming there. So the relief will be then for burden of the full tax or the uh, partial tax. Uh, relief will also be there from the prosecution action or fine and dues may be at any stage notice stage or adjudication stage or appeal stage or a writ petition right so let us await for the final notification to come when they use this particular power and the circular i've come to know that such powers are already there in customs and excise and all so this is they have now inculcated in our gst law as well so the first thing i thought that which industry can be say some time years back ice cream was supplied by ice cream parlors. Ice cream is what? It is also a food. Ice cream is not, not food. It's a food. So is it that they are selling ice cream 
एज अ गुड्स कमोडिटी और दे आर सर्विंग फूड सर्विंग फूड फाइव परसेंट टैक्स नो आई टी सी और आइसक्रीम फुल टैक्स आई टी सी अवेलेबल एंड देन द सर्क्यूलर स्कीम ओके लेट एस ट्रीट लाइक दिस एंड दैट सो नाउ सच थिंग्स मे बी रेग्युलराइज बाई यूजिंग दिस पावर्स अंडर सेक्शन इलेवन ए वी थिंक ऑफ फाइनेंशियल सेक्टर्स बैंकिंग सेक्टर सर्टन इश्यूज मे बी देर और रियलिटी सेक्टर डेवलपमेंट चार्जेस राइट नाउ द रियलिटी सेक्टर इंडस्ट्रीज में राइट टू देम दैट एवरीबडी इज फॉलोइंग दिस प्लीज एक्सेप्ट इट और लीजोल राइट इन लैंड राइट मच यू एन क्राइम सो आई थिंक the associations uh, may go for uh, some benefit under this to the government online gaming sector right huge liabilities 30 40 50 000 crore i think the industry may be ruined or the person may be ruined and so on right then uh, see corporate guarantees till that what has been happened in this particular provision uh, they have put it as for past transactions also or future transactions also so this will be there on statute so even in future this can be used for some future question arising right now let me take you through again amnesty so all this beneficial provisions i am discussing first so if something i get short time ha huh, i can say that now you read some benefits i have already uh, explained and uh, mentioned before you okay so amnesty scheme everybody has a problem teething troubles right in this 7 years of gst implementation almost 4500 in total if you count the notifications the circulars advance ruling and so on the press release and so on is almost 4500 and 7 years 84 months or 85th month july is over it is almost per day 2 and per month 50 so such things we have to read understand apply our mind right explain to your clients and then file your returns if you go wrong then you'll have to go as a industry with folded hand for 11 aus but government said okay initial teething trouble we want to resolve so they are coming word out with we call it as amnesty scheme waiver of interest and penalty so the waiver is not of tax at all for demands raised under section 73 normal cases not fraud cases fraud cases what we call as fraud willful misstatement or suppression of facts so i am referring here at it as fws so fws cases covered by section 74 for adjudication and raising the demands those cases will not be covered by this amnesty scheme normal cases may be covered so you'll have to uh, break your head whether my is falling in 74 73 or so particularly this is applicable to only first 3 years not all periods right so july to march 20 new section 128a is inserted it says where any amount of tax is payable in accordance with what one first a notice under 73 1 or 73 three right so if a notice is issued under this provisions and no order is passed against this notice under section 73 9 then in that scenario you are covered as a affected person by notice affected person badly by notice you are covered here or clause b says order passed under section 739 so right notice is now culminated into final order of adjudication under 739 where a person has say filed appeal but yet appeal order has not been passed so it's in pipeline that is covered under clause b order is there appeal is pending or a revision order notice is received revision notice the authority might have thought that a adjudicating officer has made a mistake giving some more relief of itc or taxing at lower side either can be cut off and revision notice is issued but yet order is not passed 
it is covered here i am in clause b that is also eligible for this waiver and the third part is an order passed under section 10711 that is appeal order or a revisional order under 1081 both orders are passed then you are out of clause a out of clause b and now you are in clause c also eligible and they have said condition no tribunal order fortunately till date tribunal is not there so all cases either notice stage covered notice culminated into an order covered that second one and appeal order is also covered or revision order is also now what this should be pertaining to the period of july 17 to march 20 only first three years or any part thereof suppose somebody is assessed for only two months even that is covered it's not needed that full year must be there and the condition is if the said person pays fully the amount of tax paid not a single rupee you have to keep it pending as per these three clauses covered as the case may be then in that scenario when to pay before a notified date so the date will be notified notification will come that before this date you pay and i think in uh, council they said march 25 but await they may say december 24 also so we'll have to await there may be two phases also we do not know so maybe uh, we will have a notification and uh, based on recommendation of gst council the notification will be issued what relief we will get on payment of full tax i'll be getting relief of fully from interest and penalty provision penalty liabilities so fully nothing to be paid even part percentage of interest or penalty a good uh, uh, clause all the proceedings in respect of the said notice or order or statement as the case may be shall be deemed to be concluded once you are into this particular provision so this is also made clear now here uh, Elendar member uh, the Chairman or the convener, please note down. I am giving some suggestions which you can then think of representation in a proper way because I might also forget next time. So you please note down some points. Then if needed, I'll elaborate that also. Why only first three years? Effectively, COVID-19 was for 2021 and 2122. Even Supreme Court gave relief from much things and all that. Banks gave moratoriums. Yes. So, so I feel that we should represent that let even 21, 22, next two years be covered, particularly pandemic periods. Going further, the waiver scheme should be framed like what we had in our Maharashtra Amnesty Scheme 2023 and the basic difference is here. They have said full tax payable. That means if tax dues are nil, you may not get relief. So a law compliant person to stop the meter of interest, he paid a tax amount. And he said that let me fight out also appeal, but I am paying tax at least or I'll get refund later on. He pays full tax, tax is nil, you're out of this too. I think we should represent that a person who has already paid the tax based on those notices or order, take one, two, three. Then why not? Right. So this, I think, uh, needs a representation. And uh, uh, payment of tax may be pre-notice or post-notice. Say audit happens, they don't give notice. We own our own pay. And then suppose uh, some show cause notice for interest penalty, that we say we'll fight it out and so on. So here, I think uh, some thought needed, some representation needed. Another, I thought that suppose somebody has gone in court by way of writ and some uh, directions are given in that, it is not covered. They have said only this three, then that order will prevail. Suppose the court has given the order that this should be quashed and then again take him to the uh, uh, adjudication proceedings or in uh, direction to the first appellate authority. So I think even this is uh, to be needed that anything, even final order at court should be considered for waiver. 
first proviso says where the charge is converted from 74 to 73, such orders are covered. Good. Sensible. Once you call yourself say that now no 74, but this falls in 73, then uh, the benefit also will be passed. Second proviso says if an application that means the appeal filed by the department, it is called under the GST law as application, not appeal. Appeal we file as a taxpayer, department files application. So if the department has filed an application against any order passed under these three, four provisions mentioned here, or against the direction of the appellate authority or the tribunal or court, here the court they have considered. But in primary ABC, it is not there. So they say, such is also eligible for waiver. Good. That means the order has come in my favor for out, outward levy or ITC or whatever. Whether IGST, CGST or CNS and so on. Any Anything can be there in such a scenario. Uh, if you pay the additional tax as per that application within three months from the said order, but where is order? There is only application. Or if there is a direction, then you can say there is an order. Then within three months from that said date of order is covered. Now here the problem is, suppose the objection is taken by the officer qua an issue quantification is pending. Now who will quantify that? And what reliability of that computation or quantification? So here also a mechanism uh, should be there. Otherwise, you will not come to know that suppose uh, an application is filed by department, the order is in your favor, something uh, the authority wants to challenge before that higher forum. But how much quantum and all then? Then you will decide whether I want to go for this waiver scheme or not. Okay. Third proviso says where such interest and penalty is already paid, no refund. So law compliance, more brickbats. Huh. Or a dashing person taking a right interpretation, a fighting spirit wins. Or a defaulter wins. So I think I should say that if somebody has paid tax, at least he should be given benefit. You, you can ask him to pay 10% of interest and 5% of penalty, at least if you want some revenue. But otherwise, you want him to just fight it out, then litigation will not stop. The purpose of such scheme is to even end litigations and legal machinery to be free for other work. Said waiver is not available in case of action for recovery of erroneous refund. That means, suppose I claimed refund of one crore, I got refund. After, say I got refund three, four years back. I said, this is my export of services. I got referred. And in that scenario, uh, tomorrow the uh, authority feels that we have uh, given wrongly the refund. The proceeding starts, even order is passed. Now you pay back the refund with interest. In such a scenario, such orders are not covered. You can't say that, okay, I give back you one crore, but no. Uh, burden on me for interest, you will be liable for this. is out. Appeal or writ petition pending at any forum shall be withdrawn before the notified date. So if you want to claim benefit, withdraw litigation. So here no partial withdrawal is also permitted. So if somebody feels that he has four or five issues, two issues strong enough in his favor, understanding the constitutionality and everything, in that case also, uh, he has to entirely withdraw the appeal and then only he can go for. Even this can be suggested, but I don't know whether they'll be uh, listening to that. So, how uh, better part is that the appeal must be there is not a condition. So, the demands can be at notice level, adjudication level or so. So, fortunately, appeal is not uh, required to file and then withdraw and all that. Last point says, where any amount is paid to claim the waiver and the proceedings are deemed concluded, then no further appeal in that case. And that is rightly so. So let us await for the final notification and circular 
to understand the uh, procedural modalities and so on. Now let us come back to certain provisions which their amendment is expected. It says time of supply of services in case of RCM liability for specified services under section 13.3 and tax invoice under 31.3. These two sections amendments have taken together because it has a connection. Now we all know that uh, if I supply goods or services, I charge outward side tax as a supplier recipient may get ITC as per the provisions of the law. Or certain transactions, supply of goods or services are liable for RCM basis, GTA services, advocate services, some security services. Huh? Uh, I am liable to pay tax on RCM basis. Then in that scenario, why such amendment? So I have here uh, uh, <clears throat> mentioned before you the existing provision which says time of supply means earlier of the date of payment or 60 days from the date of invoice issued by the supplier. And the issue of invoice, the responsibility, we want to match these two provisions to understand the effect. It says recipient shall issue an invoice, which we call it as self-invoice, in respect of goods or services received from unregistered person on date of its receipt. Now, amendment is this. So earlier two clauses kept the same payment date or 60 days from the date of invoice issued by the supplier. And the added terms are, which I mentioned in blue color, it says in cases where invoice is required to be issued by the supplier. So suppose somewhere the supplier is not uh, duty bound to issue invoice or he does not issue invoice. I do not have anything, but I make a voucher for or I make a self invoice. In that scenario, now C clause is added saying that date of issue of invoice by the recipient in case where the invoice is to be issued, raised by the recipient as a self invoice. So this clause was missing. So what was happening that there was no burden on a person to prepare an invoice at that point of time. So whenever he was making the payment, he was recording the transaction, making the RCM payment and he was taking that RCM paid as ITC available uh, in his case. So the section 313F about the tax invoice also is amended like this that rules will be prescribed within the period as may be prescribed the recipient shall issue the invoice. So now here we are expecting the rules which says the recipient has to uh, prepare invoice in that same month when he receives the services or goods or so. So now the liability is fixed and all that. Of course, this you can say that this is this is a almost clarificatory amendment like, but one can use this amendment to say that this was not there. I was not liable. I'll not pay interest. Even if I'm paying RCM, I'll pay RCM in cash, take ITC, I'll not pay interest. Think of Infosys today. The 32,400 crore notice what they have received and LTI mine tree has also equal received. But fortunately, LTI mine tree got the stay from Karnataka High Court. And on the same lines, even Infosys may get or Infosys may stop our uh, website. <laughs> government will be proud. But well, uh, such a company, it is uh, not uh, uh, possible that they might have missed something. They have their own experts team or they have the consultants must be guided properly, but different interpretation and so on. Well, uh, explanation uh, is uh, okay. That's not much. Yeah. Uh, last, because other speaker, if would not have there, I would not have, right? I have given, I am given only. But you park your question, we'll definitely deal. Okay. And circular was also there guiding something on this. So here the important is put in red by me. Royalty for mining lease. Right? Now Supreme Court has given verdict on 25th July stating that this royalty is not a tax itself but it's a consideration and such a scenario. Now think today if they have to shell out the tax and then uh, 
uh, at least cash they'll have to pay and then claim the ITC if at all they are eligible for or outward side if the uh, exemption is there or ITC denial is there, it's completely out of pocket money uh, they'll have to shell out. They may take the benefit under Section 11A going to the government or uh, using this particular provision, uh, they may think of paying and then claiming ITC. Interest question, as I mentioned, penalty also I mentioned, and ITC also. But at, as present, what we understand and what we follow, the day, suppose I had received the services or goods and I was liable for RCM for six months back or two years back, today I pay, next month I take the ITC. And that way accepted, only interest burden is there on that. Okay. Now let us think something, what has been changed for input tax credit. Now what this is a very burning issue nowadays. We know that I produce my invoice, I produce my books of account. Even the supplier has paid taxes. No fake transaction. Genuine transaction, I should get ITC. But can I sleep? and not file return in time, answer is no. So section 16.4 says, if you want to claim ITC, file the return in time, and what is the due date? Say, let us take example of, say, 23.24, or 22.23, just for an example sake. So for 22.23, any invoice or debit note of that period, financial year 22-23, recorded in books, payments made, everything all right. You forgot to claim ITC in the returns for 23-24. Right? I'm giving example of 23-24. In that scenario, the law says, okay, don't worry, you are not uh, uh, missing that. You can claim this particular ITC of uh, invoice 23-24 up to October return. Right, So good time is given, but suppose a person failed to take even in last October return, earlier it was September, then amended to October return due date 30th November. So now, suppose he failed or the other person had no money to pay the taxes. The lawmaker says, if you don't pay taxes, we will not allow you to file return. If you have not paid taxes or filed return for earlier month, Next month, I'll not have. Suppose my earlier month's liability was 1 crore. I had no money. Next month's liability is 10 lakhs. I have money, 10 lakhs, but I can't pay. Partial also, I can't pay. I can't file return. So I think here, one representation can be dealing the payments and returns. I am a law-abiding person. I want to accept the liability. I'm ready to pay interest. I don't want penalties. I don't want prosecutions. I don't want my I don't want my registration to be cancelled, right? And then again, uh, uh, go and ask mercy and all that. Why you make such a law? Earlier we had the, this provision, and once I file the return, you have all recovery machinery with you. So I think uh, if delinking happens, all problems solved. But now, today the problem what is which we are facing because a person could not take ITC because he was not aware. Whether he's eligible for or not, he took opinion. Later on, he came to know he's eligible for ITC. Or some invoices were missed. Accounts, accountant mistake or software problems. Or he had no money. He filed the returns late after October, November, September, October. Now, has he to lose the ITC? Then the uh, lawmaker said, okay, we come to your rescue. Now, what is that? It says we are bringing section 16.5 that notwithstanding subsection 4, any invoice or debit note for supply pertaining to year 17 to 21, four years. If you have missed that, we will come to your rescue, provided you have filed the returns at least on 30th November 21, all the four periods. So if my 18, 19 even I have filed in 21, claiming ITC, but suppose somebody did not claim ITC, no relief. So they don't say that today you can do that. So in short, here is this, they say, okay, for first four years, we give you relief. If you have paid that, uh, claim the ITC at least before 30th November 21. Okay. 
Then it says this provision is applicable from July, right? So now I was thinking that why this 30th November 21? What is the significance of that putting that and not any other date or not even 22 or 23? Then I, I could lay my hand to certain provision says, Section 39 furnishing of return was entirely substituted in November 20, and that comes in financial year 2021. So they may have said November 21. First. Secondly, Rule 61 about form and manner of furnishing return was again entirely substituted in January 20. Again, that falls in 21, 2021 financial year, March 21. So they have said November 21 as the deadline or 2021 annual return the due date is 30th November so they might have said this as the date fine then uh, I saw that uh, GSTR 3 many appeals were there the hue and cry was there that GSTR 3B is a stopgap arrangement a return in short form but actual return is GSTR 3 which never saw the face of the light. Then in that scenario, uh, the appeals were filed and uh, later on the uh, verdict was there, no, GSTR 3B is also returned. There was some amendment also to that extent. And court said, amendment is there, 3B is a return. You have not to wait for GSTR 3 at all also. So in that scenario, I feel that GSTR 3 is omitted in October 22. So why not put instead of November 21, November 20? That's our suggestion. Then GSTR 3B is a return as came out in the certain rulings and the time limit for ITC. Now here the question is, by giving this particular relief, what will happen to the cases which are already there in appeals? Will they withdraw or should they withdraw or if your uh, uh, year is 21-22, you will not be able to withdraw. You are not getting benefit in this section, uh, subsection 5 also. So I think uh, matter may be fought and the verdict may come. This The verdict and the at present the uh, last petition filed in the Supreme Court is of Shanti Motors, uh, February 24, pending. They may say that that uh, no, this is wrong. ITC is a right of the person. Once you give ITC, whether to give ITC or not is your choice. But once you give ITC, it's a property of that person. You can't snatch, snatch it away as per the constitution. So for April 21 onwards, one another aspect, the interpretation is made as taking of ITC. Taking of ITC means what? Taking of ITC in books of account. The moment I do not debit that GST element as an item of expenditure, p and account, I keep it separate. That means I am well aware of the law. I am writing my books of account accordingly. I am keeping it as an item of ITC. In that scenario, taking of ITC in books of account, it's a, a property of mice. Once you give me ITC, then I think you cannot take it back and so on. So where such ITC, now last point is also worrisome. It says clause 146, last clause uh, of CGST amendment, clause 146 says, suppose you had reversed the ITC, 16.4, I'm affected and I reverse my ITC being a law compliant person and I paid that tax. And I say, I'll at least file for penalty or interest. They say no refund available. So that means uh, if you already paid something, don't come to us as is where is basis. And section 16.6 is also inserted to give some relief to a registration cancelled person. Now what it says that if your registration was cancelled and kept in suspension, you could not file returns. After one or two years, your registration is revoked. So what happens for those intermittent period, I am not eligible to file returns. So now today, say my revocation order came last month. 
Now I am eligible to file the return. So what this clause says, if you file the return before 30th November for, of the following year or within 30 days of revocation order, then you will get the benefit of ITC. That means for two years, today I received the revocation order. Within 30 days, if I file all the returns, claim ITC for all those two years, I'll be getting that. 30 days time limit is there. But here one clause is uh, dangerously affecting us. It says, which is put in red. Condition is where availment of ITC in respect of a debit note or invoice was not restricted under subsection 4. But you are now giving benefit for subsection 4, bringing subsection 5. Then why this condition for this person? So I think something is missed. It is possible that uh, section 16.5 uh, 16, is uh, worded or uh, planned by one person and 16.6 is planned by another person. That is possible. So, well, this is there. Uh, Achha, do I have another 10 minutes? If uh, Because uh, I think I will not take more than 10 minutes. I will take it. In 74, I will not take anything. I will take 10 minutes, sir, if you, uh, if you uh, give me from your time. <laughs> okay. So, this is, I think, uh, again, a uh, problem. I think the red mark sentence should be removed from the provision. Uh, if you have already reversed, no refund and so on. So, and uh, this particular problem is there. Five, even Gujarat High Court has given a verdict that the uh, when you suspended yourself, ITC must be given if uh, even if I, the returns are filed late. But now this section may come in between to that. Okay. Fine. Uh, this is uh, ISD. I, I don't want to take uh, give time to that. TDS return, if nil also is there, you should file. Now, no, uh, not that nil return, you are not to file, file. So, that is okay. Fine. Okay. In refund, uh, uh, one uh, major amendment has come. See, I can file the refund claim on uh, two ways, uh, ways. On payment of IGST or under LUT, I export and then claim refund of unutilized ITC. Now here, one proviso is there, second proviso, it says, no refund of unutilized ITC shall be allowed in cases where the goods are exported out of India, which are subject to export duty. That means if the goods are attracting export duty, we don't want to give you refund because we want to curtail exports itself. Yet you are exporting penalty to you. Uh, that's okay. But now here subsection 15 is inserted, removing the second proviso. So second proviso is omitted. Subsection 15 is inserted and there they have made two major changes which I have mentioned here. Where the goods are subject to export duty, the refund denial scope is widened. One, earlier the refund of unutilized ITC was not available. Now even no refund of IGST paid on Payment basis if you export. So expanded this denial. Second is no refund in case of exports. Again, they have said that no refund in case of supply to SEZ developer or SEZ unit. Because in earlier the terms were second provider the goods underlying which are goods exported. So only exported goods were covered. Supply to SEZ was not denied. Now they have said zero rated supply. That means exports also affected, supply to SEZ and SEZ unit developer also affected. Fine. In summons, only one minute I want to devote to this. When a summons is issued to a person, he is asked to give a evidence or a document in any inquiry. Right? Now one is added. Now one is expanded it is also asking to give a statement because the line was missing about statement. I said, okay, you call me. I am giving you this. I am not giving you any statement. Now you cannot say that. This is amended. Another addition to this amendment, they said, okay, any person who is summoned is bound to attend either in person 
or by an authorized representative. Right? So a relief is given. Uh, Infosys director will not be attending to that duties or summons. His consultant will be attending or so. But here the wording in as such officer may direct. So if officer may deny an authorized representative, he has power even in one act. So the right is given, but subject to the authority's satisfaction. Huh. Yeah, one is there. No? no, in summons, he will say, Mr. So and so attend. Then consultant of Mr. So and so cannot go. Huh. Yeah. So then you say, you tell me what you want. Yes, yes. No, no. Blank will not do. Okay, he has to be very specific. Okay. Now here the point is, so a person attending or a representative attending, suppose I as a consultant of that client goes and attend, officer permits me, now what? A risk is there. What risk? He will record my statement, which is there like on oath and whatever I produce or whatever I make a statement is on oath, which is nothing but a judicial proceeding. So be careful whom to represent whom to not represent, what to represent, what not to represent. And finally here, when they're amending the law, they forgot to amend the clauses. Now IPC is not there. CPC is not there. They should have taken this chance, but I think they have missed it. And uh, uh, this uh, circular is there. Authorized representative, they have said authorized representative can attend. That means that is also defined in 215. It says either your relative say father, son or brother can go or a regular employee or a practicing advocate or a practicing chartered accountant or a GST practitioner or eligible gazetted officer retired. So all these are permitted uh, to attend with authority letter. But officer may say, no, I do not, I will not entertain you. I want that person only. He is right. Provision is very clear. IPC 193 is now replaced by 229 of uh, Bharatiya Nyay Savita and it says imprisonment up to seven years. So please be careful before you attend as an authorized representative to give any statement on behalf of somebody else. Huh? And 228 is replaced by uh, 267 which is for simple imprisonment if it is for intentional insult or interruption to a public servant and so Fine. Okay, uh, I think now 73-74, right? Before sir comes, I'll take maximum use of that. 73-74, sir, listen. 73-74, simple amendment merged into 74-A. Nothing. Two companies merges, assets are the same, liabilities are the same, merger happens, amalgamated company balance sheet we prepare, right? So nothing. Then what is the change? I'll tell you, right? And uh, they said 73, 74 applicable up to March 24. From April 24, 74A will apply. So transactions of April 24. So if today your transaction of 22, 23 is questioned, he will use the power of 73, 74. But 74A can be used only for transactions effected after 1 April 2024. Finally, 74A is there. Explanation about suppression of facts, the same definition, no change. Only the change is what? Limitation of notice issue and order. This chart gives you very amply clear. Uh, I will not waste time onto that. Only the changes that uh, due date for issue of notice for normal cases is extended, increased by nine months. So in a change, in simplicity, you have a more... Uh, the officer will get more time to issue notice and for uh, fraud cases decrease by 12 months. So fraud cases benefited, normal cases affected. <laughs> Due date for order issuing normal cases increased by two years. This is very dangerous. I think we should represent this. Why you want to increase such time limit in a normal case and for fraud, no change. <laughs> so all this is there. But about the charge of fraud or not, that is remains. Huh? That Suppose officer said this is falling in fraud. 
you have to rebut that why it is not falling. He has to prove that why it is falling in charge. So finally, uh, one good amendment in uh, 74 essays. Very nice, huh? this is very beneficial. Uh, there is a blockage of ITC under section 75 clause I. It says that if somebody is paying taxes under 74, no ITC. Right? You recall. That clause is there. 74 a mention is not there. So, government has rightly done this because if somebody is paying tax, why I think recipient should not be given ITC and denied a good provision. Right? So, I think uh, we accept this. And uh, finally, I think uh, uh, <clears throat> okay. Appeal pre-deposit reduced. You can read that. Uh, uh, tribunal uh, is now established. Notification yesterday only came and it will start functioning as soon as possible. Tribunal is given more, one more uh, responsibility that now anti profiteering application instead of going to that authority may be taken up by the tribunal. Finally, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have uh, might have taken uh, 10 minutes more, but excuse me, uh, sir. Uh, I tried my level best to explain you in a simpler manner. You read the provisions also properly, carefully, and uh, take your call. Thank you. I thank the association for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. very much, Deepak, sir. I would like to invite our treasurer, Vinod Maskeji. Okay, so we'll start the second technical session now. So after listening to the GST uh, proposals on the finance bill, we have our renowned speaker, CA Rajesh Adhamdi, sir. Welcome, sir. So all those who have sold your properties this year and will be selling this year, let's hear how much beneficial it's going to be. And the stock market as well. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Goods and Service Tax Practitioner Association of Maharashtra, respected President Mahesh Madhukar, Vice President Parth Badeka, and the respective professional respective dignitaries of the dais. This is the seventh budget tabled by Honorable Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman on 23rd July 2024. There were a lot of expectations were there from the taxpayer that there may be some amendment will happen in the case of MSME sector. Last year, we were aware that Section 43B, the payment to MSME has been expanded. Second, I would say uh, not expectations, but there were rumors that well tax may come 
or inheritance tax may come. So last four to five years, we are hearing rumors and you must have aware that all HNI or the big industrialists made a planning accordingly and made a succession planning. Some of the planning were successful. Some of the planning where you are aware about certain, you know. So, and also we were expecting that the cap, the, the slab rates for the individuals may increase or under the old regime, the ATC and those deductions may increase. Nothing has happened. In fact, finance minister said that she is on the verge of reviewing the Income Tax Act in next six months. Even her intention to revamp the Income Tax Act Certain amendments suggested or the proposed in this budget, which had some ramifications, not only in the case of the corporate tax, because I don't find any corporate tax is a major, but as far as the individual taxation is there, definitely individuals are going to face the problem. Some of the proposals are very beneficial to the SSE. Some of the proposals are very draconian. So we will see how to, I am sure that my presentation slide will be circulated to all members. So it is possible that I may not run through the entire slide, but I would like to highlight certain important points which may have a ramification on our day-to-day -day practice. Because yesterday you must have seen 31st July was a pressure for all income tax practitioner for filing the return. And we were expecting that because of the last moment problems at the income tax side, whether there is a, you know, at usual as a, the past tradition that that extension may come at the last moment. Nothing has happened. So let's start with the, this thing. Second thing, important point, just wanted to understand that, that there are backlog of appeals are pending before the CIT appeal. Since COVID days, those appeals are pending. And last year, you have seen that, you know, the CIT appeal, the, the officials who are basically looking into the appeals, they got uh, additional hands by way of joint commissioner. And definitely you must have seen there is a momentum has started. At least some notices have started floating. It is irrespective of fact that you already made a submission of CIT appeal. Again, they are asking for the same submission and again and again. So I think looking at this point, I feel that, you know, there are certain momentum. So let's see one by one. So what is her thrust on this budget was simplify the taxes, improve taxpayer services, provide tax certainty and reduce the litigation while enhancing the revenues for funding the development and welfare scheme of the government. She has said that in the simplified regime, 58% corporate tax has been collected under the simplified regime. And two third of the individuals basically availed the new tax regime. And if, if you read the today's Times of India, there is an article saying that till last moment up to 6 p.m. on 31st July, around 7 crore returns has been filed and which has recorded the last year's this thing around, you know, 6.8 crore. So I think this is definitely because you are aware that last couple of years, more emphasis is happening on that individuals should shift the taxation from the old tax regime to the new tax regime. So let's so all my proposals are basically effective generally is from assessment 2025-25 means financial year 24-25, otherwise stated in the respective clauses. So let's uh, touch upon basic, you know, the tax rates. The tax rate, you're aware that there is an old regime, new regime, under the old regime, up to 2,50,000, no tax, 2,50 to 5 lakh certain per 5%, then 5 lakh to, you know, 10 lakhs, 20%, and then 30, 
10 lakhs onward 30 percent tax so now under the new regime the slab was you know 5 percent 10 percent 15 percent there she has tried to tweak the the second slab where the slab was 3 lakh to 6 lakhs she has increased from 3 lakh 6 lakhs to 7 lakhs so 1 lakh additional benefit of 5 percent tax will be you know receiving by the individuals in the third slab in earlier 6 lakhs to 9 lakhs, she has increased to 7 lakhs to 10 lakhs. So that additional 1 lakh, so almost 15 lakh, 15,000 saving will be there. And over and above, if the SSE opted for the new tax regime, standard deduction is proposed to increase from 50,000 to 75,000. So considering all these aspects, she said that there will be 17,500 net saving in the hands of the individual SSC. Uh, apart from that, uh, you are aware that, you know, last four or five years, her attempt is going that people should move to new tax regime. And this, you know, just I will take one uh, minute on that, that there is a joke circulating in the uh, profession, even every household you will find that Kamwali Bai Pushtiye Malkin say, Ki Madam, I need to be a child, I need to be Malkin Bhai bolti hai, mein terko do option deti ho. Old regime and new regime. Old regime mein, mein salary to padha ke ne ho nahi degi. Lekin in, ye uh, bonus de dungi aur gift, uh, uh, festive season mein gift de dungi. Second option mein terko ba, salary badha ke dungi, lekin baaki kuch nahi dungi. काम वाली भाई पूछती है ठीक है आप इतना कर रहे हैं तो मैं मेरे चार्टर अकाउंटेंट से पूछ के आपको बोल देती हूं मेरे को क्या सो so, इंटेंशन यू नो शोस दैट द फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर वांट्स टू सिंपलीफाई द टैक्स स्ट्रक्चर नो डिडक्शन नथिंग विल बी अलाउड एक्सेप्ट प्रोवाइडेड एंड बेसिकली हुसेवर आर द वन थर्ड पॉपुलेशंस हु आर बेसिकली क्लेमिंग द रिटर्न अंडर द ओल्ड रिजिम शी वांटेड टू यू नो डाइवर्ट देम टू द न्यू टैक्स रिजिम I think intentions are very clear. I think next, I was expecting this year she will scrap the old regime. But there are certain pockets are there, you know, you must be aware about that parliament has the sovereignty power to make adjustment. But certain benefits are to the, to the parliament. So she wants to keep those, you know, old regime to facilitate them. So that may be a possible reason that she is not uh, removing the old tax regime. Second important point, just wanted to know that capital gain. I think this is very important provision. She said that she wants to simplify the uh, and rationalize the capital gain taxation. So far, so good. We used to have the three classes of specific, the capital asset. 12 months holding period, 24 months holding period, and 36 months holding period. So for the listed securities, units of UTI or business trust units, zero coupon bonds, there is a period of 12 months to cap to categorize that as a long-term capital asset. For the unlisted security for the email property, there was a 24 months period was the holding period for the long-term capital gain. And for the other asset, it was a three years. So now she has made simplified the life, either is par or us par. So what she has done for the listed security for the units of UTI business trust, she kept that 12 months as a holding period. For the other assets, other than this, she has made a life simple that only 24 months. So any assets held by the SSE other than the listed security units of which uh, the units of uh, UTI or the business trust. Those will be, you know, regarded as a long term if you are holding more than 24 months. I think this is a very welcome provision. Second important provision, what she has made. Uh, I mentioned about, you know, various categories of assets one can look at. Second important provision she made, she has simplified the tax rate also. So for, if you see, for the listed security, she has made amendment in 2000, 2001, 2018, whereby earlier sale on listed securities were exempt in the hands of the taxpayer. 
Thereafter, she brought the taxation at the rate of 10%. And now she has basically increased the tax rate from 10% to 12.5%. Similarly, for the short-term capital gain of the listed security, earlier it was 15%. Now it is proposed to increase to 20%. And for the other assets, which was earlier 20% capital, long-term capital gain tax, this has been reduced substantially to 12.5%. In one hand, she has given the benefit of you know, reduction of capital, uh, the, the capital gain tax for the non-listed security or the assets. But in the second hand, she has taken out the indexation benefit we used to claim. And you are aware that 1993, the indexation has started with the intention that the SEC should get the benefit of the inflation to the cost of the assets. And now the intention is that he, now she wants to make the law simplified. So definitely we require to see whether by reducing the tax rate and by reduce by removing the indexation benefit, whether SSE will be happy or he will be the loser in that game. Depending upon the facts of the case, one is required to analyze whether he is beneficial or not beneficial. As you are aware that, especially in the case of immoral property, if the SSC acquired the prior property prior to 2001, there is option has been given to the SSC, either actual cost of acquisition or fair market value as on 1st April 2001. Of course, the fair market value will be restricted to the stamp duty value. Whichever is more will be available to the SSC. And over and above that, he used to claim the indexation benefit. So today the index value is 363. And if you take 2001 benefit, 3.63 times, you get the uh, incremental in the cost of acquisition. That benefit you will not get. But replacement of fair market value on 1st of April 2001, you will get. But thereafter, you were using the indexation benefit. That will not be available. So here the 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 SSC is arguing that whether he is confused basically whether he is a better off or he is basically losing based on the certain facts of the case the study which you know you you must have also got in the WhatsApp and all the circulation that in which scenario I should be better off so the the study is that that if I expect twelve point five percent return or or increment to my cost of acquisition every year, I would be better off under the new provision. If I don't expect the return 12.5% or less than 12.5%, then the old regime was the means with indexation benefit was more beneficial. Of course, it is facts of the each case one needs to analyze. Second important point is that now the entire game has changed because of the she has made upset in the competition formula. Let's understand. Section 54 and Section 54F, you are aware that individual and HUF is entitled to avoid or not avoid, but you know, not to pay capital gain tax. They can make investment in the residential house property. So Section 54 talks about sale residential house property, purchase a residential house property, you will get 54. But 54, the deduction will be allowed to the extent of the capital gain. The reinvestment also has to be made in relation to that capital gain portion. But in relation to 54F, if you sell the capital asset other than residential property and reinvest into the residential house, section 54 is available. Where the formula is different. In order to claim 54 benefit, entire sale proceeds you require to invest in the new property. So now let's understand how this will change. Let's, let's, let's understand that there is a sale proceed of 1 crore. Cost of acquisition is 20 lakhs and the index cost is 50 lakhs. So with indexation, my capital gain will be 50 lakhs. Without indexation, my capital gain will be 80 lakhs. In 50 lakhs, 
if I reinvest in section 54, I would have made investment to the extent of only 50 lakhs rupees under the indexation, this thing. Remaining 50 lakhs, I would have taken out from the market. For 54F, I have to invest entire one crore in that new specified this thing. Now under the new regime, just see, imagine, under the new regime, my capital gain will be 80 lakhs rupees, one crore minus 20 lakhs. For 54, 54 deduction, I require to invest 80 lakhs rupees in that new property. Whereas under section 54F, one crore cap has not changed. I need to make so, but accordingly my take home money has changed because of that factor. So this is the inverse relationship happen that in, in one hand you will be eligible to get the more benefit in second hand you will lose depending upon the class of the assets and where you are making investment. Because of the tax rate has been reduced and I would say that it is welcome provision because 20% tax and now you are paying 12.5%. Definitely, you will make your money white by paying only 12.5%. So, the encouragement is that all the real estate project, all the transaction will happen in white on paper. Because I am paying only 12.5%. So, second important point will happen in the case of the listed securities transaction. Listed security. Similarly, 54 EC, there is a 50 lakhs, you know, investment in the specified bonds are there. There also the equation will change. People will think that by putting money in that bond, how much money you are going to earn, 4%, 5%, and on that also you are going to pay taxes. Instead of paying 12.5%, I'll be better off, you know, putting money. So instead of putting money in that bond, I will put in the SIP or this, you know, mutual fund and earn better return. So people will start thinking about how to make investment in those, you know, uh, the specified bond under the uh, 54 EC. So that also makes uh, very clear. Second important, she found that there is exponential growth on the stock market. Definitely. So that's why, why should we not, you know, increase the rate from 10% to 12.5%. People won't mind in paying more taxes if she is going to. Second important point you must have aware that this new generation or ones who has filed the return yesterday, there are a lot of FNO transaction has started. People have started, you know, playing on the stock exchange, earning money. And that is the basically, you know, uh, psychology is that 95% of the people will lose the money and only 5% people will earn money in that FNO. And we require to see that how you will fit in that 5% of people. People always trying to figure out how should I fit in that 5% people. So she said that, and today, yesterday, Sebi chairman had said that 50,000 50, to 60,000 lakh rupees, crore, sorry, crore, People are losing in the FNO transaction. And that's why she is very concerned. And that's why she said, rather than putting in FNO, people should make investment in the mutual fund or the IPO. I think that would give a more return. And therefore, what she is trying, she is now increasing the security transaction tax also on those sale of option and sale of, of course, definitely it could disintensivize the people. But you need to understand that psychology of the people that kaam nahi karna hai, lekin paisa kama hai. And you must have seen that because of the people losing in the market, they wants to, you, you know, uh, increase. So that is very important aspects we require to see. So Similarly, the respective amendment happen in the case of NRI taxation also, if they are, you know, make investment in the listed and unlisted security, they also get the benefit of 12.5%, 15%. This is one important aspect you require to see that if indexation benefit has been removed, but for the non-resident SSE, the exchange fluctuation benefit, which they are enjoying in the capital gain tax is still there. So the all non-resident 
Indians who are playing on the stock exchange or who are putting money on in the Indian properties. So there they get the benefit of the fluctuation of the foreign exchange. So that is there. She has not touched upon that aspect. Second important amendment in the capital, the short-term capital asset, you are aware that since last two years, there are market leak debentures and, you know, spe uh, the specified uh, mutual fund acquired after 1st April 2023, where most of the investment made by the mutual fund in the liquid funds. So those called as a liquid funds. There, she has categorized those species of asset as a short-term capital asset, even if you are hold more than three years. So now here also, she has extended that, uh, widened the base of the capital asset. Now, in addition to market link and units of specified mutual fund, now unlisted bonds, unlisted debenture will also come within the, you know, classification of the short-term assets. And here also the short-term as asset basically specified mutual fund definition she has in, uh, amended, saying that all the investment by mutual funds in the debt market should be more than 65%. So those cases basically going to be effect. Second important amendment is very important. The last this thing is that definition of transfer. As you are aware that under section 45 of the Income Tax Act, capital gain will be taxable on sale or transfer of the capital asset in the year in which the assets takes transfer. Now the issue is that how to compute the capital gain tax, cost of acquisition, sorry, sale consideration minus cost of acquisition. This is a simple formula. But certain transfer would not be regarded as a transfer for the purpose of capital gain tax. And one of the aspect was that if any capital asset is transfer under a will or by way of gift, or you create a irrevocable family trust, and if you pose, dispose the assets in that trust, this would not be regarded as a transfer for the purpose of capital gain tax. And the FM has seen that less, last couple of years, even corporate people have started playing on this aspect. So there were a corporate gifting happen from one corporate to another co corporate for the you know shares transfer as a gift. Normally, gift happen out of love and affection to the, the natural person, but not in the. So now she wants to basically restrict that scope that only individual and HUF is, you know, allowed to transfer by way of will or the gift or by irrevocable trust, not otherwise. So I think this is very important aspect one needs to consider. Second important thing is a rental from residential. Nowadays, you are aware that there is a uh, the lot of the studio apartment people have started making investment and showing the income from that studio because along with studio apartment they are giving the entire facility maintenance everything that you know owner will take care of whether the income derived from that property will be income from house property or business income now it is said that everything will be taxed as a income from house property so what will happen Whatever the expenses incurred for that property used to claim as a deduction, now you will not get, it will be restricted to only 30% standard deduction. If you are better off, yes, then definitely income from house property will be the better off. Second important, she has touched upon the remuneration paid to the partnership firm. You are aware that in 1991, the entire scheme of the taxation of partnership has revamped. Earlier, the partnership firm used to pay tax and thereafter, the partner used to pay tax on the profit share in that partner. Now, once the partnership firm paid the taxes, partner is not liable to pay tax. Now, she had just, and there was a threshold limit how to draw the remuneration from the partnership firm by the par working partner to claim the deduction in the hands of the partnership firm. So what will happen? Partnership firm will be able to claim that as a deduction, but in the hands of the partner, it will be taxable as a business income. So now that threshold limit has, you know, increased from 3 lakhs to 6 lakhs now, and accordingly, the, the entire computation will change. Second important point we require to see that now whatever the remuneration by way of salary, by way of interest on capital 
commission, bonus withdrawn by the partner, it will be subject to TDS by the partnership firm. So there will be 10% TDS will happen. Now here, controversy or I would say uh, another uh, issue will come. Some of the SSE, some of the partnership firm or some of the partners of the partnership firm are basically maintaining the books of account on cash basis. Like all our professional, this thing we are maintaining on cash basis. How will deduct tax at source? Certain partnership firm prepare the partnership deed in a such a way that as per this formula under 44 VV, this will be the restriction on the partner's solution. They may now require to amend their partnership deed to bring to the parity of the otherwise, you will be entitled under the old regime if you don't change the, the partnership remuneration clause in the partnership act. Second important thing that sometimes you withdraw over a period of time from the partnership firm by the partner, but the remuneration entry you pass at the end of the financial year. At that point of time, FM is expecting that you should have deducted tax at source on monthly basis, which is not possible because if you see the, the TDS provision, amount credited or paid whichever is earlier. So, so you require to think from that perspective also how to prepare. So you will you will it this will happen. What will happen is that partners will stop drawing the remuneration from the partnership firm and they will be happy with the profit share because anyway profit share is an exam in the hands of the partner. So definitely the partnership firm has to think over it because if you don't deduct tax at source, 30% payment will be disallowed under section 40B. So therefore, these are the all ramifications you need to understand. So she has tried to touch, you know, the partnership also in this. For foreign company, important amendment just wanted to highlight the tax rate has been reduced from 40% to 35%. I think she has mentioned in the, her speech that she wants to attract more foreign direct investment from the foreigners. So that's why she wants to incentivize and definitely what will happen that corporate tax rates also reduce from 30% to 22% to 15%. And definitely the foreign um, uh, company would think over it, whether they should set up a subsidiary or they should set up a branch of the Lazen office. Of course, Lazen office is not liable to tax, but the branch is supposed to pay tax on that. So definitely to that extent, it will be welcome. Second important for the Lazen office, there was no penalty for filing, you know, that respect that form 49 within 60 days. Now she has put condition that there will be maximum penalty of 1 lakh if you don't file within 60 days from the end of financial year. Equalization levy she has removed because there is a huge cry from the US saying that, you know, all the e-commerce operator don't uh, charge, you know, those, those uh, the equalization levy because they want to go for the uh, pillar 1, Pillar 2, Corporate International Tax. So indirectly, she is hinting that we would shift to Pillar 1 approach to the for the international tax. So she has removed that 2% equalization levy, but other 6% levy she has kept. Family pension, if you fall under the new tax regime, the family pension limit has also increased from 15,000 to 25,000. Another important aspect, angel tax. You are aware that for the startup company, they have given exemption that startup, if you register under the startup, then no angel tax. Now, what do you mean by angel tax? Angel tax is nothing but the, the private company issue the shares to a shareholder more than the fair market value at a price. So if the mark, if the fair market value as per the valuation is supposed 10 rupees the face value, 50 rupees is the FMV. And if you shares issue at 100 rupees, then the 100 minus 50 will be taxed as the income from other sources in the hands of that company. So earlier UPI regime was there. They brought this concept and it was restricted to only resident shareholders. Last year budget they extended to the non-resident shareholder. But this year budget she has removed. She is omitted. Now she said that this provision will no longer will be applicable. So people will be happy, corporates, private limit company will be happy with this provision because most of the startup 
companies were you know having this issue that whenever they were uh, raising the fund the there was an apprehension from the investor whether you know whether it will get tax in the hands of the investing company or not so basically that has been done but the, the hanging sword was that that yes 56 to 7b has been removed but section 68 is still there that in the case of issue of shares the issuer company is required to the source of that investment in the hands of shareholder but also source to source also is required to prove and if you are not able to prove there will be 60 percent tax on that issuer company so you required to see whether you will be better off by removing 56 to 7b or are you opening another pandora box under section 68 because under section 68 like it's called unexplained cash credit or you know by the so now we require to justify whosoever is investor making money there is no money laundering is involved everything as per the you know there is no hunky dunky and therefore we require to see that yes this section has been removed but you should face the the problem as far as the section 68 is concerned dim dividend this is a i would say till the budget day or i would say till 30th september i am going to use this be beneficial provision how to pay money back to the shareholder in the tax efficient manner you are aware that if you declare the dividend there is a 30 percent tax plus uh, surcharge will be there, education says will be there. Of course, the surcharge also you must have increased, you know, 2 crore, 5 crore can go up to 37%. But for the purpose of dividend capital gain, there is a cap of 15%. But still, you are worse off getting the dividend because you require to pay that much tax. But therefore, we all professionals were advising all our clients please go for the buyback scheme. You don't require the court approval. Every year, you will be allowed to uh, buy back the shares to the extent of 25% of the net worth. Now, department has seen that people are using rampant this provision because under 115 QA, what used to happen that the company who is buying back the shares is required to pay normal corporate tax plus 20% plus surcharge buyback tax and thereafter in the hands of the shareholder it will be the tax exempt proceeds now all the exempt tax proceeds will be taxable as a dim dividend in the hands of the shareholder and but she said that till 30th september i am allowing this window so whosoever wants to do a buyback please make sure that you will complete the payment also before 30th september of course, you require to see there is a cap of 25% of net worth and one year, once in a year you are allowed. And therefore, if you can, this thing, and therefore, you know, the people have started thinking how I will be better off. Yes, in buyback provision, even under the proposed amendment, non resident will be better off. How? non resident is entitled to claim the tax treaty benefit. And most of the tax treaty, the dividend tax rate is 10%, 15%, maximum 20%. That is a flat rate without surcharge, without education sales. So in one hand, if your shareholder is a resident, he'll be losing the money. But in second hand, if the shareholder is a non-resident, he will be required to pay tax at the rate of 10% only on dividend. Earlier, the existing regime, non-resident was worse. They were saying, here company was paying additional tax. I'm not getting any benefit. So they were paying taxes in India through that company. Plus they were also paying taxes in their home country as a capital gain tax. So now the equation has changed. Even non-resident are welcoming this provision. So, so we required to see the 30th September time has given and because of this considered as a dim dividend, the company is required to deduct tax at source at the rate of 10% whenever there is a buyback of the shares. So that also has to be kept in mind. Charitable trust, we are witness that charitable trust was only the agenda of all last seven years budget. 
because of you know certain uh, charitable trust has misused the provision and therefore they found you know couple of the amendment every year you will find this provision has been raped every year but this year there are the amendments are there but those amendments are welcome as amendments beneficial to the ssc so let's took two three this thing there if there is a you know old regime or the there are two uh, regimes are there under section 1023c there is a one regime and section 11 to 13 there is another regime so 11 13 you require to fulfill certain condition you require the approval from the um, commissioner in the first regime 2023c basically education institution medical institution funded by the government and non funded but the receipts are less than 5 crore but in the first regime there was a full exemption was there under the second regime 85 percent of the amount you required to spend in the charitable object that was the condition now they wants to make only one regime so whatever the you know regime you fall under 2023c till the validity of that approval that will continue whenever they go for the renewal you require to make application under section 11 to 13. so now first regime 1023c will be over a period of time will go and everybody will be under section 11 to 13 regime you must have seen that there are the very uh, draconian provision that you know certain charitable trust does not fulfill the conditions of the object or uh, commissioner found that you know they are misusing the charitable trust or they have made the ch changes in the you know uh, the trust deed or you have not filed the return in time or you have not filed the registration application in time there was a accredited taxes used to pay by the the charity commissioner at the 30 percent maximum margin rate on the net worth of that so you will lose the charitable status once you breach that condition now they said that for the approval of the commissioner for ATG or 12AB, we will condemn the delay, but you require to specify that there was a reasonable cause or not. So this is the basically important, I would say a welcome judgment that if you prove to the commissioner that there was a reasonable cause for not filing in time, they will condemn the delay. Second important now merger between the one approved institution with the another approved institution is now possible. So there will not be an accredited taxes on that. So both the charitable trust can be merged together like a corporate merger. So here also, now they have put a specific section with the conditions. So we require to see that aspect. So after 1st October 24, yeah, object of course, there are certain conditions are there object has to be similar so that is also very important so after 1st october 24 23c will not be there new applicant 23c will not be there so rationalization of tds provision yes the tax rate has been reduced from 5% to 2% so one can look at those provision uh tds on the sale of immune property i think we day to day handle this issue that if the resident per, uh, if 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 the property is purchased from a resident uh seller the buyer is supposed to deduct tax at source at the rate of one percent if the amount is more than 50 lakhs rupees there if you are more than one buyer or if you are more than one seller we used to place that 50 lakhs limit should be applicable vis-a-vis -vis that you know for each Deductor, I will get 50 lakhs. Now they say that no, no, aggregate value would be regarded as a the consideration. So earlier we used to run uh, get away from this provision, but now they have basically uh, plugged the loophole. This is important provision under section 192. The salaried employee, if you are aware that salary is employee are worse off every year. So they are paying such a much tax and all the business people get away by claiming expenditure. So here they want to basically, you know, extend the benefit of that. If any TDS or TCS paid by that employee, you know, there is a provision that if the employee declare his other income to the employer, 
employer is supposed to compute the, the estimated income and deduct tax set, so considering that the other income also. But TDS and TCS credit was not available. Now they said that if you suffer a TDS, TCS on that other income, that will also be accounted while calculating 192. So say example, that uh, the seniors, the, the person who has, you know, uh, sent his uh, child for the higher education outside India. And last you are aware that TCS provision, you know, under LRS scheme, 5% uh, TCS will be collected. Or if you buy a motor car, more than 10 lakhs rupees, TCS will be collected. So individual was not able to, you know, there was a cash flow issue. Now what the salaried employee can do, that information he can pass on to the employer and when the employer will calculate the TDS portion, he will give the relief. He will consider that TCS and TDS provision and on net. So there will not be any cash flow issue. Similarly, the TCS on the luxury goods, you are aware that, you know, last couple of months we were watching on the WhatsApp, the marriages and all the thing and, you know, freebies has been. So now they put that apart from the car, there will be specified goods will be listed where if you purchase more than 10 lakhs rupees worth of that luxury good, 1% TCS will be collected. Now here, the department is going to see what is the source of income, what is the source of expenditure, whether your income you declare where commensurate with that size of, you know. So all the things will be checked by the department. This is other important prospect, the TDS and TCS statement. There is a, you know, the TDS, TDS quarterly return is required to file. And if there is a correction, the correction was allowed to be made to that TDS and TCS return. But there was no time limit. Now they have prescribed that up to six years, now the time will be allowed to rectify your TDS, TCS return. Second important amendment they made that once you fail to pay, TDS, TCS, there was always hanging sword of the prosecution. Even one day delay, they may initiate the prosecution and all the things. So they said now, wait, if you pay the taxes along with your return of income, I will not prosecute to that extent. So they given a leeway time. Otherwise, if you if you delay in you know depositing the tax, but if you pay that tax till the filing of your, your quarterly return, you won't be prosecuted. So I think this is very uh, welcome. Another aspect is a reassessment. You are aware that from, you know, 2001, entire reopening assessment has been revamped. Earlier six years was there, the threshold limit that has increased to 10 years. So three years and 10 years was, you know, time limit for the reopening assessment year. So if the amount is more than 50 lakhs rupees by way of accounting entry or assets or something, then they give the leeway up to 10 years to reopen the assessment year. Now they have reduced that 10 years limit to now five years. So I think this is very, very welcome. But at the same time, last year when the reassessment, the entire proceeding has been, uh, the, the provision has been revamped, they, they basically removed the provision of block assessment from the statute. Now they brought block assessment again on the statute that six years, if they found search seizure cases happen, in that case, six years return has to be filed in one go. What is happening last four years? Because of the block assessment has gone, the assessing officer has to issue notice for every year. So there was a, you know, uh, uh, the uh, lock, uh, work, workload also on the assessing officer. Now, what will happen because of block assessment after 1st September 2024, if any search takes place, then that will be governed by the block assessment. Old search will be happen under the, the reassessment 148 and all the things. Now, let's understand. Earlier, assessing officer was having a power up to go up to 10 years. That year has been reduced from 10 years to 5 years now. So suppose the asking officer must have certain information in his possession, which is running beyond three years or beyond five years, up to 10 years. Because of the block assess the reassessment year has been reduced from 10 years to five years. 
what will happen to that the the documents so definitely up to 1st september 2024 they are given time so if the assigning officer has those information he can go back up to 10 years and post september he cannot go beyond 5 years so this is very the important uh, amendment you require to see so if the proceedings under which sector Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Under one forty eight. So that will go on. That will go under old regime only. So they said that the search initiated after first September only those cases block assessment will happen. Yeah. No, so so wherever they are giving opportunity to under 148 a notice, you required to basically give all the reasoning for that. Okay, we will we'll discuss that uh, this thing. Okay. Now, there is an important uh, two amendment this thing happened in the case of, you know, assessment uh, hearing that if the, you know, if you miss the birth of the revised return, if you have not filed the return at all, then under section 1192b we used to make application to the commissioner and commissioner if he agrees that you are you have justification he will allow you to file the return but there was no procedure for the assessment in those cases now they said that ki once the commissioner approves your return to file there will be assessment proceeding will happen in the time bound manner so i think this is very important aspects one needs to see second important point is that once the once the matter is set aside by the tribunal to give effect to the tribunal or CITP law order, there was no time limit to the assigning officer to give effect to that order. Now they put the threshold limit that there will be time limit for the giving the uh, giving the effect to that tribunal or CITP law order. So this is very important aspect. Like uh, time limit for up filing appeal to tribunal. There you are aware that 60 days Receipt from the CITP order, one get the time to file the appeal to the tribunal. So now they say that instead of date of receipt, you, re you will get time another, basically, two months from the end of the month in which you received that CITP order. So there will be, a, I would say, you know, 10, 15 days additional time one will get. Power of the CITP is now expanded to even set aside a matter. As you, you are aware, the tribunal has a power to set aside matter. Tribunal has a power to annual assessment. CITP has a power only for the annulment or for the enhancement. Tribunal does not have the enhancement power, but CITP was. But CITP was not having set aside power. Now they say that because of the COVID, you know, during the faceless and all the things, Many SSC is not aware about the, you know, they got the SMS and they ignore that this thing. Nobody is aware about this procedure. So now they said that if any ex party order has been passed by the assessing officer, but the SSC has filed appeal against that ex party order, then this commissioner will set aside those order back to the assessing. I think this is very important. Otherwise, in normal trade, CIT people used to ask for the remand report for the additional evidences. So I think that can be now cut down. Yeah, 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 that is true. So reduce the CIT bill load that Vivatse Vishwa scheme has also come. Yeah. Setting off and withholding tax, you know, the assigning officer has a power to withhold your refund if there is a demand. And they may adjust also. Now they have their power that another additional 60 days they will get. If suppose the refund is due and certain assessment is pending, but he is expecting that he put demand as a so he would have power to withhold tax, you know, refund. 
Now they said that apart from that, another 60 days I will give. Because normally within 30 days from the, the order, they get the time to pay the demand. And I think from that perspective, they must have, they, they don't need to give this 60 days time, but now they have given that 60 days time. Vivat Se Vishwas scheme. You are aware that, you know, there is a lot of concern on the pendency of the CIT appeal. Seconding that uh, settlement of their lot of demands, outstanding demands are there. And in 2020, you are aware that Vivat Se Vishwas scheme came. I would say it was a good response, response from the officer. But from 20 till 24 also, another cases of, you know, the litigation, demand has started. And because of, mostly due to the CIT pill pendency, I would say. Now they are coming with the same, same Vivatse Vishwas came with the same avatar. So now they said that ki all the pending cases as on 22nd July 24 be eligible for the Vivatse Vishwas scheme. They given the first payment deadline up to 31st December 24. If any assessment pursuant to search and where prosecution has been lodged or wherever there is a uh, uh, income or set outside India regard to DTA, those cases will not be eligible for Vivatse Vishwas scheme. But majority scheme will be more and like the same. The only one exception was that if as on the date of 22nd July 24, assessment order has been passed, but the appeal is not due for filing. Those cases are not covered under the new scheme. Uh, that was covered under the 2020 scheme, but definitely suggestion will go and those type of cases will also come. Scheme will get notified this thing. And this is basically, you don't have to pay interest and like, you know, GST, the amnesty scheme has come, the interest and penalty. Similarly, this is also that once you pay the taxes, no penalty, of course, they have given a time limit. Now here that two four basically subcategories. You are aware that earlier old scheme was there till 2020, 31st January 2020. Now the cases are there till 22nd July 24. So they have bucketed this, you know, the calculation that whosoever has missed the bus of last scheme and still they want to go for, then there will be additional tax of 110, 10% more extra you have. Otherwise, your case is pending between 31st January 20 till to, uh, 20, uh, 22nd, then you have to pay only 100%. But in those cases, 110%. And similarly, if your tax area is also on account of penalty interest, and that is only only appeal matter, then 25% disputed appeal. So there also they are given 31st January 2020 and this thing. So there one can see for department appeal, this tax rate will reduce to 50%. So this is very important that if you are succeeded in the CIT appeal level or tribunal appeal and department is in appeal, in that case, if you want to go for buying a piece because you are succeeded, normally penalty should drop automatically. But if you feel that, you know, I don't want anything you want to buy, you can go for the amnesty scheme and get away from the penalty, prosecution, all the exposure you can, you know, get relieved. Another important aspect, just touch upon, you know, uh, I will take only five minutes now. There are amendments in Benami Property Act, Black Money Act. So Benami Property Act, there was a protection. There was no protection. There was a, you know, prosecution was there one year, prison made and those things were there. And normally in the Benami Property Act, there are three types of, you know, assesses involved. One is a legal, beneficial owner, Benami Dar. And third, the person who can induce the person for buying that property. There are three types of person. And there are prosecution to all people were there. Now they said that ki, because the Benamidar never used to come and forefront that, ki, you know, I have full disclosure about this thing. But he was worried about that thing. Now they said that if that Benamidar come forward, become an approver and disclose all the transaction, no prosecution will be launched against that Benamidar. I think this is a very important aspects one needs to consider. Second, for Benami Property Act, there was no time limit for responding the notices. Now they say that three months time limit will be given. 
Another important aspect is the Black Money Act. You are aware that Black Money Act and income tax play, you know, the, the, the hand in hand. And you are aware that for resident assessees, if you have the income or if you have property outside India, in the income tax return, you require to give, make a disclosure. So earlier, there was a provision that if your cash balances or bank balances are up to 5 lakhs rupees, and if you not disclose in your income tax return, there won't be any you know penalty. There is a penalty. If you don't disclose income, then 10 lakhs rupees penalty under the Black Money Act. But there was a leeway given only to the bank balances less than 5 lakhs rupees. So now they have increased that limit from 5 lakh to 20 lakhs, but all movable assets now they have. So even the share security, if you're not disclosed. So like a stock, she has given an example of stock option. Various resident has exercised these stock options, never disclosed. <coughs> so if their value is less than 20 lakhs rupees, they can disclose. Another important case yesterday, I just, you know, somebody has asked me, what is the repercussion under this act? Is that person was a non-resident 10 years back. When he was a non-resident, he acquired the email property. And now that client has come to him and after this thing, now that person become a resident. So he is paying taxes in his global income. But he never disclosed his income from that, you know, house property abroad. Never disclosed in the return of income. Also, he has a house outside India. Now that client has come to my, you know, friend as a first time. What should I do? I said, as per the law, you are supposed to declare that income because he has become a resident of India. His global income will be, of course, under treaty, certain exemptions were there, but that exemption is also no longer to the, you know, rental income. So you require to disclose. But when I saw this amendment, I figured, I flag it out to him that if he had not disclosed those assets, he will also fall under the Black Money Act. See, he has a justification. He has also, you know, proof for the source of investment also. But he never disclosed once he become a resident. So that exemption is given only to the non-resident and resident, but not a resident, but not to the resident. And therefore, now those cases will cover under the Black Money Act. Second important thing, as you are aware that there is no objection certificate required if a person, you know, if person migrate or when he is at the airport for the immigration check, you know, we are not seeing any uh, newspaper latest anything that somebody has hold at the, uh, the airport for the immigration security thing that you are not paid taxes, you are not obtained, no objection certificate. But now they brought that if any tax is outstanding under the Black Money Act. And if the resident wants to, you know, leave for the country, he has to bring that no objection certificate from the tax commissioner. I think this is very important aspect one needs to see because some, everybody has forgotten that we don't require the no objection certificate because it was required only for the person who is not domiciled in India. But this now is, of course, department said that we don't because thereafter paper cutting has also come that are you going to force every resident who wants to fly outside India to get this? And no, no. We want to go only those cases against which, you know, use tax demand or this Black Money Act proceedings are this thing. And those cases only they will ask the SSC to bring that no objection certificate. They are issuing. They are issuing under Section 213. But that's why I think nobody has tested this thing, you know. We we saw, I think, I, I, I would say... Okay. But under Section 230, there is a clear cut provision is there for the no objection certificate. So we require to see that aspect also. But now, because of this amendment, now again, that has, you know, dhul jam gaya tha us provision pe. Now, <laughs> so we require to see from that aspect also. So I think uh, I covered uh, the, you know, the amendments in the uh, direct tax front. If there are any question, I'm happy to take up. Yeah. Sir, 
Ah, so the 23, 23rd, 22nd July, they have given a cutoff. Yeah, there will be two calculations. So prior to 22nd, if you sold a property, you will get indexation. After that, if you sold a property, you won't get indexation. So that limit will be there. I have the case, like he was about to register the agreement on 22nd, but he could not register the agreement. Now those cases, you know, he has to pay taxes without indexation benefit. Twenty second July is the cutoff. <laughs> yeah. Thank you everyone for your patient hearing, but uh, before we have our official vote of thanks, uh, I would like to call upon our president for one important announcement. Please be seated. Let them get the mic. Let them just have a breather. One minute. Where is Will next? Uh, I will not take much of your time. Uh, let me announce that on 3rd and 4th, we are having orientation program because many are there on the uh, online also, many members are there and conveners are there. We are having an uh, orientation program for members, for managing committee members, office bearers, then conveners and district, uh, district association members. So there will be a two days program and uh, there will be coordination amongst uh, all stakeholders will be there. All seniors, uh, our past presidents will be there. So they will have the guidance. Those who have newly come as a managing committee members, there will be orientation. There will be one-to-one -one have a discussion. And uh, those who have yet to, those who are invitees and yet to enroll are requested to enroll. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a quick question now for just five minutes quickly? So we also had some opinions like people said that let them ask for the demand and then we'll pay. <laughs> so
and the purchaser has directed your mail and there from there also the information gets generated plus in, in addition to that uh, the information from joint register gets generated so twice the sale of property appears then you get an option to amend and to, uh, as to whether that information is correct incorrect or partially correct like that so the, if someone doesn't do that uh, or if there is some thing that one does not correct Will it be referred to any kind of notes, etc.? No, definitely. Because if you don't report that information is not correct, definitely they have all the powers to remove from your case. Okay. Because they will definitely see that what are the investment you have made. Of course, that one transaction you will get three entries. Same transaction, you will have a three entry. Purchase from the sub achievements of the sub register. Second, if you are not a student, the TDS will deducted, you also get additional entry. So even 194 I also uh, the same notices come up. So if you don't respond to that notices, you be prepared for this. Thing. But but in 148, at least you get the opportunity to you know before he select your case fit for the reopening, he gives a 15 days or three months time. That point of time is not a notice. It's uh, it's the, the the information that you get at the time of what we see in the AIS report. He's asking about that. Yeah, how do there you get all the information. Now, sometimes what happens, this is my own personal, personal case. I don't have any FTI of 2.99 lakhs, but some bank has shown that the my name of 2.99 lakhs. Party, 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 so yes. you know, Mr. said that allow that limit if the money is parked in the second one, it's back to that to the money. Um time get, you know. So you will get the account number also from yeah. from which account number that information has been generated. That account number doesn't belong to me. So you have to reject that thing. Yeah. Yeah. You have to simply reject that. If the you have to so I have to respond to each and every point. Right? Yes, yes, yes. And where it is not possible for me to uh, edit, uh, that option is not available. Yes. No, okay. There is no provision under this thing. There is no edit or option. Is I can accept or this thing. Correct. Yeah. 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 So this this can be an invitation for uh, yes. uh, next lesson. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have seen that you know I have joined account. My husband is having a wife's name is only for administrative purpose and now wife is getting notices. Yeah. She, her case is reopened under 148. Now sir, there are so many, so much of details available regarding investment also. My husband and wife, my, husband, my, my wife and me have the, the, the joint investments. So those actual, those investments actually false. Yeah. In both of the information. That has to be corrected. So here for, only for administrative Purpose, your wife, your name has been added. There, you should reject those things. Okay. Because whatever the income you are considering in your return of income, there is no question of uh, this thing. So, you prefer to reject those. In that case, mention also number of accounts. Now, there are two accounts of a joint may have to be two accounts. Mm -hmm. You have to go in the SFT column. And option may you have to uh, select one yeah. another pen yeah. number of another. Then they ask the pen in whose name it is that investment. And you can uh, simply answer that, no question will be resolved. Sir, uh, for the new capital gain and the modification, uh, they have now said that listed security. So, does, does uh, uh, listed not convertible details just cover under listed securities? Listed non convertible details. Ah, or so because those things fall under 24 months, you see. 24 months, 24 months. Not under 12 digits. No. 112 is your fault. Okay. So, so now, now we have 24 months. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Other than equity shares, it will be 24. Okay. So, this is one of the opposite. Uh, uh, only equity. Only equity. Equity was. Equity was. Equity was. Equity was. Listed and non convertible in the there will be 24 months. 24 months, yeah, not one, one year. Okay, not one month. Oh, okay. And another, another thing, uh, the, uh, the transfer of capital assets 
So, with the redevelopment of a property, also makes a lot of the definition of transfer of uh, capital. Yeah, redevelopment of a property fall under the definition of transfer because transfer is the extinguishment of the rights. So, where you are basically joint development, you are the specific provision section 45 that it will be taxable in the area you get a completion certificate. So, the tax liability will be postponed, but of course, there are difficulties are there how to claim 54 and 54 and benefit. Yeah, yeah, your date of transfer is not a date of payment. Are you required to see So, in this case, if a commercial shop is a building of commercial building goes under redevelopment and a new commercial property is received, then I don't think the reinvestment is happening in our you won't get any benefit. And redevelopment means. You have to self-develop. You should be the owner of that land. Ah. You are the mere member of that society. You won't get the benefit of 45 pi. Normal section 45 will apply to you. Where you are the owner of that land. Ah. And if the land is going for the joint development, where you will hold the land and the other person make investment in the development activity, in that case only section 45 pi will be. But if you are a member of the society huh. and the society is going for the redevelopment, mm -hmm. then 45 pi will not come into picture. Okay. So that's what happens or that's it happens. Yes. It happens. But since you are going to get another plan, uh -huh. you will get 54 benefit based on the Bombay Act judgment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But sir, so in that case, what is the same consideration? Self consideration means you will have to register your documents when the new property, you know. One, one is for the redevelopment agreement will be there with the developer and the society. And second will be when the plan will be allotted to you, you require to again register that agreement. So the hotel, the stamp okay. will be your consideration for that. Yeah, yeah. There is no specific provision for that. I'm just telling you based on the experience. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever the Basically, uh, market value of that new plan that will be your self consideration. So, government will be going into redevelopment and if another commercial property is not, you won't get any benefit. No benefit. So, better. So, you will end up paying taxes. And if you said that the NSAC is only up to 1924 GSC. What I understand is since the orders for 2021 could not be passed by that time, they did not take them in the other orders. Yeah, no, this is that, but since I, what I understand is that they want to first exhaust the date of the passing of orders after that, because if they are again, we need endless history under income tax, then why not under GS? So probably at a later date, they, they will come up with a, one more GS. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Yeah, I think uh, any other question? <laughs> None? Okay. Any more? I think. Yeah. Okay, now. I would uh, like to offer a hearty word of thanks. But before that, Abhi Jaisi Dinesh Ji ne pucha, uh, unko, Atavle sir, ko, what is a fine? So, Atavle sir ne bula, fine is a tax for doing the wrong. So, unho ne bula, what is tax then? They said a tax is a fine for doing the right. So, in that case, uh, Dinesh Ji, I think uh, you need to do the right and agar FD aapka hai, to tax bar do. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we are grateful that uh, both our speakers, uh, Deepak Thakkar sir and uh, Rajesh Atavle ji, we are great. Excuse me. Yeah. We are grateful that you shared your expertise and enthusiastically engaged our audience. The presentation and insights were informative and inspiring. As uh, Deepak ji said, as is, where is basis. So we have to accept uh, whatever, everything with as the false, as the definition says that, so it has to be, the tax has to be paid either wholly or partly and uh, may not be refunded and we have to accept with all our faults and defects. So GST as well as income tax, we have to accept it as it is, how they say, representations need to be made. We have noted down the point. 
Deepak Bhai, that you have suggested us. And you also explained us regarding the payments and returns and the refund amendment, which was there in the financial proposal and the Bhatia Nair Sansta 7473 Club into 74A was also useful information. And uh, Rajesh Atavle, sir, uh, as you said, there's a lot of backlog of appeals and uh, income taxes come out with this new Vivat Vishwas. So we would like to welcome that. And your expertise on the capital gain, I think that was really important. People have made a lot of money into stocks this year and properties selling and buying. So we will also share your number with the association members and your email. They can come to you for direct queries. TDS, TCS is also being an integral part of GST as well as income tax. Now, as we know, as Sir also said, that anyone having the income over 50 lakhs, they are supposed to put that schedule of assets in their return, whether it's ITR2 or ITR3. So I think the government is trying to cap you round and find out all your income and your sources and what you're spending. So thank you so much for to Deepak Bhai and Rajesh Ji for your in-depth knowledge on GST and income tax. We are grateful for sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much. Can we rise for the national anthem, please? Uchal jaladi taranga, tav shubh naame jage, tav shubh aashish maage, gaaye tav jal gaata, janagana mangal daayak jayake, parat bhaagya vidata, Thank you.